Welcome to the Bigfoot Society podcast. In this episode, I talked to Rovan and Brenda from the Bigfoot Finders about their history of Bigfoot encounters in Tennessee and the unique way they're experiencing them today. If you've experienced something similar to what the Bigfoot Finders have or have more information regarding Bigfoot or other cryptids in the same area, please reach out to me immediately after this episode. And if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, please contact me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com. And also make sure you check out BigfootSocietyPodcast.com where you can become a member and get extra episodes. All right, Bigfoot Society, I've got the privilege of talking to Rovin and Brenda Rhodes. They reached out to me about how they've experienced some really interesting things down in Tennessee over the years. We're going to hand it right over to Rovin and Brenda. Sure. Thank you so much. First of all, usually it takes most people that are really into cryptids had something happen in their childhood, teenage years, and that was the case with me. My situation, my grandfather had a farm. I live in West Tennessee now, but he was in Middle Tennessee, right in the exact geographic center of the state, a place called Las Casas, Tennessee, um, right outside of Murfreesboro. And my goal in life was to spend all my life with my grandfather as much as I possibly could. My my parents uh, felt I needed to attend this thing called school, so they kind of reel me in sometimes. And uh, But I spent at least every third weekend every Christmas break, every Thanksgiving break, and every summer with my grandfather at his home from the time I was really old enough to walk. From the time I was in school, but before then, I just stayed with him all the time that I could. And I love my grandfather dearly. His farm was surrounded by hundreds of other acres of of land. And and really the people didn't, either they didn't care if we got over on them or they didn't know. Uh, But as long as we respected the property, my grandfather didn't care. And so me and my friends would just wander uh, in that last Cassis area with just woods and, uh, you know, did a lot of hunting, did a lot of fishing up and down the East Fork of the Stones River. And I remember even as a young child, on my grandfather, out in my grandfather's yard, and we would hear what I know now to be wood knocks, but we didn't know what it was. We had no idea. And I'd always ask him, I'd say, Pop, what's that? And he said, well, they must be building a barn over there, but it would always be at like dusk dark. And so there was, um, you know, that we knew that there was no power over in those woods, no, no way anybody had electricity. And so therefore they couldn't possibly be building a barn. My friend from down the street, he'd just look at me and shake his head. We were in maybe second, third grade, but he was already all through those woods and he said, there's no barn over there. Nobody's building anything, but we would hear the wood knocks. You fast forward a little bit and I was either 12 or 13. I normally say 13, but I'm not 100% for sure at my grandfather's. I'd taken up deer hunting and my grandfather was my best friend. He would do anything for me. He knew that I really enjoyed fishing. And so because of that, he had dug me a pond in the, on the back of his property. Now, when I say he had a hundred acres, it was split up into two parcels and the parcel he lived on was about 39 acres. And the other one was 61 and it was at the end of the road. And so just due to proximity and not liking to walk in the dark and stuff like that, I would always go deer hunting on the land that was connected to his home. He had dug that pond. And so I would, I called it scouting, but I just, instead of before deer season, I never took my deer rifle. I just take a 20 gauge shotgun and go back there in the fall and just see what I could see before deer season. And it was one particular day, probably in 81 or 82. And I had went back, you would go out his back gate and through some woods, through about a million ticks and cedar trees and come to a logging trail and go down that logging trail two or 300 yards. And you walked out into what we called his sage grass field. His property was very narrow and deep. And so the sage grass field was on the back side of his property. And I had went back there like I always do, probably in September, I would think. I remember some of the leaves were maybe starting to change, but not much. And as I went back there, I I just remember the day was many times we see them now and it's not totally quiet, but it was just very surreal. It was like there was something off about the day is the only way I can explain it. And on the pond that he had dug for me in the middle of the field, I stepped up. On that pond, I would always walk around that pond where I could get an elevated view of what was going on because the sage grass was maybe two and a half, three feet high. And this particular day, I got to the 
far end of the pond or the pond bank. There was never any water in it to amount to anything, by the way, because you know, the only 100 acres in Rutherford County that would not hold water. But I get to the end of it, and I look down to the right-hand side of the far end of the field, which was maybe less than 100 yards away. And I always check that end out really good because my deer stand was there. And it was when they had dug the pond, they had cleared off the far end. Everything had been pushed away except for about eight big trees. And it was probably 85 yards across the field at that point. There was a fence line there and there was these big eight trees. And instead of being tall sage grass there, there was maybe three or four inch grass that had, sp- that had just sprouted back up where it had been bulldozed off. And so I looked down there. And something looks funny out of the right-hand side of that field. It was the way I explain it to people is almost like I was looking through an intense heat or maybe if you're pumping gas in the middle of the hot summertime, that wavy way that things look when you look down at the gas pump and the heat coming off of it and the fumes, it looked like that. It almost looked like I was looking through a heat. And I remember rubbing my eye because I thought – that there was something in my eye, but instead I see somebody start to walk out of that corner of the field. And my first thought was just, oh no, I'm going to, nobody else is supposed to be hunting on my grandfather. So I'm going to have to tell him to leave. And as it began to step out, I, I began, my second thought, the first thing I saw that looked unnatural was not, it, it, it was all brown, but I thought that's brown coveralls and brown boots, even though it was a little warm for that, and a brown toboggan, brown gloves, which I thought was strange. But the first thing that looked awkward to me was the gait. It was how this thing was walking. It As it, it stepped out from under the shade and took two or three steps out, going very slow, all, almost methodical. And I've always felt that it wanted to let me see it. I've always felt it was intentional. But as it did, I noticed that its its legs, it didn't walk right. It, its legs never locked completely. It was almost like it was scooting. Its arms were exceptionally long, and it was exceptionally big. And by exceptionally big, probably between seven and seven and a half feet tall based on how tall it looked when it walked right under my deer stand. But I'm looking at it, and then I realize as it steps out, out of the shade, uh, probably about 3.30 in the afternoon, a windy day, it steps out of the shade, and uh, it had to know I was there. The wind was blowing straight from me to it as well, but it, I began to see that the, the sun glisten on its hair, and for some reason, I thought hair and not fur, but just hair, it just, this thing looked nothing like a bear. People that say that are just, they've never seen one. It looked very human, but it was just unhuman. I remember the head arched forward in an unusual way. And it was almost like the bend in the neck was, it didn't really have much of a neck, but its head bent forward from a lower vertebrae than a human would. So it's, its whole body from somewhere between the shoulder blades was just slanted at about a 45 degree angle and it was lurching forward, but it was walking upright, long arms, almost exaggerated swings of the arms. And then as it got out into the sun and took those few steps, I remember it swung its shoulders and looked directly at me. It almost, it it almost seemed like it, it shoulder shifted too, because it didn't just turn its head. It wasn't all the turn of the neck, but it was like the shoulders just shifted. It looked straight at me, but it never stopped walking in the direction it was walking to the other side of the field. And when this thing looked at me, I just, I don't know how to explain it, and I don't claim it was mind speak. But what I do tell people is I felt this overwhelming impression of don't mess with me, and I won't mess with you. Mess with me, and you will regret it. And it took about two or three steps as it continued to look at me. It wasn't looking the direction it was going, but it was walking. And then it turned its body and head straight back the way it was going, which was falling directly under that fence row and just kept right on walking. It just, it, it, it seemed like that it was just saying, hey, I'm in charge here, don't mess with me and you'll be all right. But I've always felt it, it meant to reveal itself. I'm standing there on the bank of that pond. I've got my 20 gauge shotgun with one, it's a single shot, it's got one quail load in it. And I've got two more quail load in my hunter's jacket. And that's all I've got. 
with me and I'm holding that gun at a 45 degree angle pointed upward and I'm looking at this thing and I don't even I tell people I don't even feel like I breathe because I was just frozen whether it was fear or just frozen some way I don't know but I just remember hearing my heartbeat in my vein in my neck and just watching this thing and I didn't even move my head I just moved my eyes until it walked completely across that 80 or 85 yard wide field and out of sight. The moment it got out of sight, my thought process was very simple. And that was, hey, either I take off running because we were going to crisscross. If it followed that fence row, didn't cross any fences and then followed another logging trail, I was going to crisscross with this thing on my way back to my grandfather's. Or I could run in the direction that it came and hope it just wasn't sitting there waiting on me and go circle around and go back home the other way. So I remember thinking for just a split second, as soon as it went out of sight, but I thought I'm going to go for it. So I took off running as fast as I could, just as fast as I could with that shotgun back the way that I came. And I thought it was, there were no, videos on YouTube. There was nothing. There was very little information about Bigfoot. And I didn't know they were as fast as I know they are now, but I'm thinking I can outrun this thing. And so I took off back toward my grandfather's house as fast as I could. And I could just see it stepping out of that logging trail and intersecting me because the two trails intersected. So I didn't even look. I didn't even look to the right or to the left when I ran down through there. I just ran as fast as I could, probably close to half a mile, maybe a third of a mile home and went in the door just panting for air and they said what's wrong and i had heard of bigfoot and i told them i said i, I just i think i saw a bigfoot back there and my grandfather believed me i think he knew they were out there and my grandmother said uh, oh son you just saw old Slewfoot or old she had a name for it but she believed me and i never really talked i told a friend about it i didn't tell a whole lot of people about it became somewhat interested in the the subject That same fall, I was back there in that same field. Now, I would not, even though that happened in the daytime, my deer hunting, going back there at night, early in the morning or late in the, coming home late in the evening was over. From that point forward, I thought, I'm not going back in those woods unless I have my Marlin 3030 and it's completely loaded. I'm not going back in those woods unless I can see everything, unless it's daylight. And I pretty much quit hunting, but I went back a few more times. So that same fall, I go back there to the same field Uh, a little bit later on in the year. It is deer season. I have my Marlin 3030. It's loaded. It's got one in the chamber. And as I get back close to the field, probably a hundred yards from it, I can hear what I thought was two men talking, but it was very loud and very boisterous. Sounded like it was coming from massive lungs. And as I got closer to the field, I realized that whoever was talking, they weren't on some adjoining property. They were right there beyond the wood line in that field. And I realized, too, I thought that it was just maybe it was out in the woods. There was an echo. I'm like, why can't I understand them? And as I sat and listened, I thought, they're talking in, in a foreign language. They're talking in Chinese is what I thought at the time. I said, these, and they sounded big, too. They just sounded like two. I, I'm like, what in the world are two big Chinese guys doing out here? in the woods on my grandfather's property. And I was just confused. I never forgot that day. Did not know that was the samurai chatter until I heard heard the Sierra sounds later on and heard, I think it was MK Davis, Bigfoot in a shed or something like that. And I'm like, parts of that sounded just like, but it was a distinct language that I heard. Never made the connection. Didn't know what it was. I was just confused. And anyhow, that Kind of ended that. So if you fast forward maybe three years, I was either 16 or 17. I think I was 17. And this is quite the experience here. And it happened within three miles of my grandfather's farm. But this one, I had a friend with me. He had just bought a boat of mine. as a 14-foot V-bottom boat. And we decided to put that boat in on the East Fork of the Stones River in Las Casas, Tennessee. And uh, guys, if you know where I'm talking about, there's the whole place has changed now. But the, the mill pond that was there it was Brown's Mill. Brown's Mill has collapsed. There's been a lot of building around there. But anyhow, this was in, 80, in, in April of 86. And we decided to go down the river smallmouth bass fishing. And he says, hey, let's just make a weekend out of it. 
So we were going to spend sat, uh, Friday night, potentially Saturday night there, and come home on Sunday. So the first night we put the boat in, and if you're familiar with that, anybody's familiar with that stretch of the river, you can almost you can wade most of it now. But back then, before the mill collapsed, you couldn't. And so we float the boat down. The river's a little higher than normal. It's uh, maybe a foot. And we float down, float down to a gravel bar that I'm aware of. It's about a mile and a half down the, the, the river there from the bridge. And we set up camp. And the guy I was with, he was a rugged outdoorsman. He was just an amazing guy. He was a good friend at the time, but he was much older. He was, I think, 29. He was married and lived next door, and he had children and foster and stepchildren as well. And we set up camp. He started a fire. He could. He was really good at just the outdoors, everything outdoors. I, I just like to fish mainly. I hunted a lot, but I love to fish. And I won't give his name if I don't let it slip out of respect. But this this affected him in a very deep way that night we were sitting there on the gravel bar and we were just we had the fire going and we were just looking out at the water it was really chilly i normally wouldn't wanted to camp out with it that cold but we decided to make a weekend of it and he looks at me it's probably about 9 30 9 or 9 30 and he says and he had a very deep voice he said it sure has gotten quiet outside and within 10 seconds of of him saying it sure has gotten quiet outside. It literally sounded like a bomb hit the water right upstream from us. Just words cannot describe the impact that whatever had just hit the water had. It, it wasn't something being thrown in the water. It was it, honestly, it sounded like something was dropped in the water from a high altitude. And so my friend and I, we did not get up. We launched to our feet, landed on our feet, shaking. It was like dead quiet out there. He says it sure has gotten quiet. And then here comes this massive splash from right outside of our fire's light. So we're probably 75 feet away from where this happened and probably 50 feet of this or so, maybe 60, 70 feet of this is gravel bar. And we know which direction it came from. And so he grabbed his flashlight, which was, it it wasn't much of a flashlight, but it was all we had. And he grabbed it and we start making our way down the gravel bar. I'm just looking over his shoulder and we go to the end where we know this thing hit, something hit the water and we look out. And the first thing that you can see is these massive red eyes. When I say massive, I'm talking unnaturally huge, the size of silver dollars. And they were solid red. They were like a bright red. And he put his light on it, but they were almost what I would call self-illuminating. These eyes were like, they were so big, but I would not I, my brain would not allow me to comprehend the fact that they were eyes. So I'm making all kinds of excuses in my mind. And then I think, what could it be? I, it was, the, these eyes were probably six inches apart and we were just trembling and shaking. And my friend who's with me, who I've seen do things that were absolutely fearless that I was afraid to do. He starts saying, it's a monster. It's a monster. It's a monster. And I told him, I said, it it can be a monster. And I knew that cows came down to that area to get water. And I said, it's probably a cow that just fell in the water. But by that time, we could see not just because his flashlight was really weak, but we could see not just the not just the eyes glowing, but we could see the silhouette of the head. And the head was so big. And remember, at that time, no YouTube, no anything, no Internet, had no idea Bigfoot got in the water, nothing. And my friend just kept saying, it's a monster, it's a monster. And he was out front. He was maybe three feet in front of me, and I was just peeking over his shoulder. He had the flashlight. He was right at the corner of the water. And this thing was no more than 20, 25 feet out in the water past the edge of the gravel bar. And I know I know the water there was seven feet deep or so at the time with the river up like it was. And this thing was just looking at us. It just looks at us and... My friend keeps saying it's a he's cursing, it's a monster, it's a monster. And 
I told him, I said, it just can't be. And then it tilted his head. It's like it tilted its head to the right and to the left, both of them, just slowly. It tilted its head, and then it straightened its head up, and then it tilted its head to the other side. And it was like, I felt like whatever this thing is, it's examining us. And as the light, as we began to adapt to the lighting and see a little bit better with his really bad flashlight, You could see the silhouette of a head, and there was at least 14, 16 inches of head that was sticking out of the water, and the eyes were just right above water level. So probably its mouth and its lips were right on the water, and still there was maybe 16, maybe even 18 inches of head sticking up. This thing's head was just absolutely ginormous, and we could start to make out the brow ridge and maybe the nose. You could see a little, but you couldn't see everything, and it just stared at us, and we watched it for probably probably two and a half minutes right there and it was we were just my my friend was just shaking he was shaking and I was I he was far braver than me I was far dumber than him but I was in denial I was just simply it can't be there's got to be a logical explanation for this somebody's pranking us I don't know what this is and then the strangest thing happened it pushes out toward the center of the river not all the way to the center but it pushes out toward the center and it starts to go downstream toward where we're camped, toward where the fire is. And it goes in this zigzag pattern super fast, much faster than the current. The river was up, the current was moving, but this thing is far exceeding the speed of the current. But immediately I thought, this looks like I do if I'm in three and a half feet of water and I'm using my feet to push off as a six foot tall person. This thing looks like it is pushing or propelling itself on the bottom. And I know how deep that water is as it just shifted back and forth. And the whole time it went downstream, so it had probably 70 feet or so to go downstream to to end up right in front of our campfire. The whole time it went downstream, its head and eyes were turned directly toward us. So it's moving. There's a zigzag pattern going on, but it's looking directly at us. And it goes down really fast until it comes to an abrupt stop directly in front of our campfire. And now because of the light of the fire, we can see it better. We can make out more. And we're those big massive eyes are still there and it still it does the head tilt thing again and we're just looking at it and we're both in shock and awe and fear and my friend looks at me and he says we had forgot totally forgotten he had his 12 gauge shotgun there is loaded with a double off buck and he said hand me my shotgun and he handed me the light he said hold this light and he took his shotgun and the moment he pulls the shotgun up to his shoulder this thing goes massive bubbles. It goes straight underwater. Blah, 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 just massive bubbles. It vanishes, and we're just left there. Nobody says a word. I don't even know if we were breathing. We were just like, what did we just see? And we wait in probably five minutes. We don't see anything. Nothing comes up. Nothing. We listen for it coming out of the water. We listen for nothing. The the river probably turned maybe 50, 60 yards down. The river took a crook. But we and so I assume it swam underwater and came up around the corner. But we never saw it again. So we're standing there on the bank of that river. And my friend, we're just shaking. We're just shaking. But yet he's more afraid than I am because I'm just my brain's just not letting me perceive it's trying to fit it into every logical box I can. And finally, after about 10 minutes, he says, it's got to come up for air. And in retrospect, I, I believe it did somewhere we couldn't see it. But at the time, he said, it's got to come up for air. And then he said, we're going to stay up all night and we're going to take shifts and we're going to watch for it because that thing could come out of the water and kill us. If he would have used the term Bigfoot, I would have been, I'd have probably just laid down on the, the gravel bank and into fetal position and started to shake and cry, but he didn't. He just said, he just kept calling a monster and he said, it's going to come up. It could kill us. And so I told him, I I said his name and I said, I'm not staying up. I don't know what we just saw, but it wasn't a monster and I'm not staying up because he said, we're staying up all night. And so the next morning when I got up, he had been up all night with his shotgun right across his lap. He'd kept the fire going all night. And instead of spending the weekend there fishing, he said, let's load up. And we loaded up. Never said, the only thing he said that morning about it, he said, it never came up for air. And then we never talked about it again. I don't think we said a word on the way home. We we left a day and a half early, 
from our fishing trip, never spoke about it again. And this is one of the reasons that I do this because I'm not saying that this was the motivating factor, but I know that my friend had major PTSD on that trip home. And I, he did take his life within two years of that event. He was dealing with other demons and a good guy, but he had some problems. And so I'm not contributing his suicide to that event. But I know that on the trip home and our relationship was changed forever. We seldom talked after that. He moved away and, and everything was different. And so that um, obviously years later, I get, you know, and I'm, I'm very technically challenged. Uh, thank God for Brenda. She's not a tech superstar, but she's the, the best we've got. But long before we, we were together, we've just been married for a little over a year now, just celebrated our one year anniversary on March the 3rd. Yay, Brenda, I love you. But uh, long before then, back in the mid 2014-15, I finally graduated from my old flip phone and I started to look up things about Bigfoot. And I never know, knew that anyone had ever seen another Bigfoot in the South other than me. And I thought it was so strange. And I started to look it up and I realized there were all kinds of Bigfoot and even other cryptids that had been seen here in the South. And then I start to dig a little deeper. And a lot of people are talking about these huge red eyes, just massive glowing red eyes. And, and I thought, wow, maybe that was a Bigfoot that, that my friend and I saw that night in the East Fork of the Stones River and was close to my grandfather's house anyhow. And he kept saying monster. He could see it more than me, better than I. I was a little bit behind him and shaking in my boots. But then I did some more research and I found out these things are, are very good in the water. Listen to Tim Kumbo Baker talk about one swimming two or 300 yards underwater in, in the Mississippi. And I put two and two together. And I said, that's, he was right. It was a monster and, or at least it was a, a Sasquatch and it was massive. This one, the first one that I saw was seven to seven and a half feet tall. I've always guessed it about 350 pounds. This one from the size of the head was three times bigger than that first one. It was just unbelievably large. It's just, it's hard to even wrap your brain around, but I, I sat on this stuff for years and years. I'm 55 years old now. Started to look on YouTube with my, my former, I'll just say my former wife did not really like me talking about this stuff. So I didn't. And when Brenda and I got together, I said, Hey, uh, there's something I got to tell you up front. I saw Bigfoot, a, a couple of Bigfoot in my life when I was younger. And I want to, I'm interested in this stuff and I want to go out and see if we can find one and, and actually photograph it. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. Sounds fun. <laughs> she said, I, she's always loved UFOs and, and the paranormal. And it was just an amazing fit. But that's, that's how I found out what my second encounter actually was. And it's only been now a year and probably a year and three weeks, maybe 13 months since Brenda and I have been out photographing these creatures and we're just blown away jeremiah with the amount we've been able to photograph in that time so that's a little bit of the story of my my early childhood getting started <laughs> and what i saw that obviously kept me very interested in this that's incredible oh man rovin thank you so much for sharing all that i do before i ask some questions yeah in all seriousness i'm sorry that you did lose uh such a good friend suicide is a a very serious topic. If anyone's listening, I'm going to have uh, the suicide hotline number in the show notes. There's always someone to talk to you. It's a very important topic to me. Um, you're, Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're in your encounters is some really incredible things. I did have a few questions that I, I wrote down along the way. The wavy figure on the edge of the field and then the creature walked out of the corner of the field. Do you think yeah. there might have been perhaps a portal involved or? I didn't until Brenda and I started researching for ourselves. And I, I say research, we photograph. We don't really mm. research like most people. We do everything wrong compared to most people. But until we did, I totally thought Bigfoot was just Gigantopithecus. I thought this was just a giant, thought to be extinct, a black creature that was still out there, did not make the connection. In retrospect, with what we've photographed and what we've seen, absolutely, positively think it 
walked out of a portal or something similar. I don't know. There are many names for this type stuff. But, yeah, based on our, our current experience today, that's what it was. It was like I was seeing it through that kind of heat at first. But I always thought, as a kid, you try to rationalize everything, and I always thought, hey, maybe it was maybe it was just something in my eye. My eye was blurry, or it was windy that day. And so I remember rubbing my eye. But yeah, in retrospect, I definitely think it was a, a portal that it was walking out of. It's very interesting, and that a situation like that, and you've probably heard of the situation that happened in Skinwalker Ranch way back. There was like they saw a, a portal type thing open up on top of the ridge, and they saw a Bigfoot type creature come out of the portal. You know, personally, it's not what I hold, but the cool thing about this podcast is I talk to people from all different views of there's no right or wrong about Bigfoot yet. We haven't yeah. gotten the specimen yeah. to study yet. And it's just fascinating yeah. to see the different viewpoints of, of what makes up this creature from how different people view it. But I, I've actually got a question for Brenda. Did you ever have any encounters with Bigfoot growing up or was your journey kind of started uh, over this last year with uh, Rovin? I had never even thought about Bigfoot or Dogman or any cryptids before I met him. I was always interested in UFOs and aliens and ghosts. Never saw one. Matter of fact, I moved from Michigan after I graduated from college to Arizona, partly in hopes of seeing an alien but and a UFO, but I never had. So yeah, my thoughts of, I never even thought of Bigfoot or Dogmen or anything until Robin came along and spoke of his experience. And I know this man for years, and he is not one to tell a story for any reason to get a girl or for glory or anything. He just does not lie whatsoever. And if, when he told me the story, I said, yeah, I know I haven't seen a UFO or an alien yet, so I'd love to see a Bigfoot. <laughs> and yeah, that's how it started with us uh, and uh, with myself awesome. too. What, what a perfect yeah. match it sounds like for sure. Over the last year, you guys have gotten... It really into some interesting things. I've watched some of your videos on TikTok and it, it's just, it's such a fascinating thing that you guys are getting into. And I'd love if you'd be able to share what's the deal with the Bigfoot finders and what you guys have been doing over the last year together. Sure. Thank you so much. And what we've been doing is it, it just, we can't even believe we're living this ourselves. That's how overwhelming it really is to us in our wildest dreams we never thought we would see the results we're seeing and we're humbled by it I, I sincerely mean that we don't think hey we've got this all figured out but yes we one thing that the first thing that that blew our mind was our first day out ever and we got the the bigfoot on the cover of the book the bigfoot finders there's a juvenile out front. You'll even see like a scar or some sort of a marking on his head or something where maybe there was an injury. Just all these things that you can't. And there's another one looking over his right shoulder. And we had, if you're, I'm sure you're familiar with Scott Carpenter. We'd heard of some of Scott's stuff. And we're like, we're going to go out and see if we can get a, a picture of Bigfoot. Uh, at the end of that first day, if you've seen our videos on TikTok, a lot of the weird cryptids that we photograph, stuff I've never seen, never heard of, far beyond dog man and, and little people and all that stuff. We we get all that stuff, but a lot of that stuff was in the same round of pictures that we got our first Bigfoot in. And when I say our first Bigfoot, the first day we went out, Brenda and I had a discussion and we were like, it could I told her, I said, it could literally it may take us ten years to get some sort of a, a picture. And we came back, and, and we just had old Samsung Galaxy S8 Actives. It, that was my phone, and her phone was worse, if you can imagine. And we didn't have quality anything. We didn't even know what we were doing. We didn't think we were going to get pictures. We just knew we, were, we have fun with everything we do. It's never just about finding Bigfoot or, or getting pictures of cryptids or Dogman. With us, it is literally about the journey. We love each other dearly. We love life and we're living, we're, we got started together in our fifties and we're living more in a year and two years than a lot of people live in a lifetime. So we're so blessed, but we go out and we have a lot of fun and we're about to wrap the day up 
And I told Brenda about what Scott Carpenter had said. And and just to put a, just to make a long story short, at this point, we photographed well over sixty Bigfoot and sixty Dogman last year, which I understand people being skeptical of those statements, but just check out our TikTok, check out our website and listen to our hearts because there's no, it's almost too much for us to believe, but it it is true and accurate. But this first day we're out there, we smell something. It just smelled, Brenda describes it as a mix between de- you know, dead animals. Dead animals and wet gym socks. <laughs> dead animals and wet gym socks. We stopped at that point. And I'm just looking around, oh, what do I do now? And Brenda starts taking pictures. And uh, by the way, she got, she's standing 40, 50 feet away from me. And she got, if she would have had a decent phone, it would have been probably the best dogman picture I have ever seen in my life that day. She got two of them. And I am 50 feet from her, same area, and start photographing. Now, we didn't know we had photographed anything, but a lot of the weird and strange cryptids were in that same round of photos is the Bigfoot and Dogman. So all this stuff was together. It's, if I was trying to convince people, I would do it totally different. I would maybe get one clear, good Bigfoot shot and that's it. But instead we're getting all this stuff together. We didn't know it. We go back to the car. We look through the pictures real quick. We're having a great time. We went on home and we were set to be married a week later. And I was going out of town in the, now two weeks later, I was going out of town in the interim for one week for some training at work. And so yeah, uh, this man is training on an iPad because he's technically challenged. He couldn't get a sing this program that the company went to on the iPads and he, he couldn't figure it out. So they sent him out of state to get additional training. So we do not know how to Photoshop or put anything in pictures or even take anything out of a picture. So we're, we're not technically <laughs> inclined whatsoever. Sure. And we haven't had many people say, but they're like, they think this is fake. I'm like, I can't even, we can barely figure out if it wasn't for Brenda, we wouldn't even have a TikTok because I can't figure out how to do any of this stuff. But I'm on an airplane looking through because I'm in airplane mode. I can't do anything else. I'm in airplane mode. So I started looking through some pictures from our trip the weekend before. And I look through the pictures of Brenda and I just having fun and, and having a blast. And then I start zooming through the pictures where we had that horrid smell. And I, within a, probably the second photo I looked at, I zoom in and bam, I'm looking at the cover, the, the Bigfoot on the cover of the Bigfoot finders just hidden back there. You wouldn't even know they were there. I took a screenshot and I pulled it up more. We didn't know. Now we know how to lighten the, the background a little bit and do some uh, very simple things like that. We have much better phones. We still photograph with just our phones, uh, but we didn't know any of this stuff. And a chill came over me as I realized I'm looking face to face at not just one, but multiple Bigfoot kind of all crouched down together, looking straight out at me. And by the way, 95% of the ones we photograph are looking straight at us. By the time I got done looking through all those photos, we're seeing not just Bigfoot, all kinds of weird stuff in there with Bigfoot. We realized we'd gotten about, by the time we looked through Brenda's photos, we'd gotten six Bigfoot that one day. And I know if I was a skeptic out there, this is the kind of stuff that used to drive me nuts. I wouldn't even listen to somebody that said things like I'm saying because it seems too absurd. And it does to us too. The problem is we just keep getting pictures of these things. And so it just absolutely blew our mind away in Roanoke, Virginia. And I'm calling Brenda and I'm like, look at this picture. Tell me what you see. And uh, just kept sending her stuff. And and it, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then if you saw the TikTok video, the one that we blew to life size, eight feet tall, we call him Pat. And he He's walking away, a big muscular Bigfoot. We got that one in the same round, the same day, same place. And then Brenda sent me her pictures and I start looking through them. And holy moly, that I'm looking, she's got dogmen in her picture standing up bipedal, just blows your mind. And so that was kind of our introduction. And we thought, we thought our first thing, we, we it changed our mind. It changed our worldview big time because we had thought these were just natural creatures. And there was a lot of other weird things, unknown cryptids, one cryptid with a skeletal type face. It was only three and a half feet tall, but it looked like a Bigfoot. We got just the weirdest stuff. One little owl-like creature that Brenda says the, the most evil looking thing that we've ever taken a photograph of. 
It has arms. It's crazy. And you can check out our TikTok if you don't believe us. We don't make this stuff up. But anyhow, we got all this stuff. And we thought, wow, we must have just walked into the day of all days, the lucky Uh, If you call it luck, it's either good luck or bad luck, but whatever you call it, we call it luck. The luckiest day of our life photographing. Something's up. We'll never do this again. So about a week later, we decided, hey, we're going to go to this other place. It's at the other end of the state from, from, actually, we were in Kentucky, and this is in West Tennessee. Today, we photograph Bigfoot in Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Kentucky. But we live within an hour and 15 minutes of most of those states, so it's, it's easy for us to do. But one thing we do different, Jeremiah, is we don't have a research area. We don't like going to the same place over and over. We like going to different places where people have never seen Bigfoot just so they meet our criteria. And that's where we wind up photographing most of our Bigfoot is at new places. But we went to this one place, and I just – all I know to tell you is you just get – After you've been around them, you get where you feel in your gut when you're around them, and you just know. And something told me, hey, let's go to this area. We went to this area, and we got two Bigfoot that are in our book, the Bigfoot Finders. The second day we ever went out looking for Bigfoot, we got two more Bigfoot. And we're like, wow, this has got to be like two flukes in a row. There's no way. And by the way, to catch people up to speed, if you haven't, heard of us or heard of our book or checked us out or saw anything on TikTok, we, 90% of the cryptids, 90% of the Bigfoot we photograph, we don't see, maybe 95, we don't see until we get home and zoom through the photos. Last year, we saw seven Sasquatch in, in real life, but we photographed well over 60. So most of the ones we find, we and the best pictures we get, we find after we get home. The best ones are normally not the one we see because they've already moved or shifted by the time we photograph. But we did photograph well over 60. We don't see most of the ones, just where everybody will understand that, until after we get home and Zoom or we get back to the car and Zoom. Sometimes we do, though. So we do get to see them from time to time. But Brenda and I continued on this journey. We realized that... One thing that we found is is people that have to understand all this naturally just by wrapping their brain around it, by logically thinking through it, they're like, wow, you can't have Bigfoot and Dogmen together. That doesn't make sense. You can't go out and get so many pictures of Bigfoot. That doesn't make sense. You can't. Where do they, people always ask, where do they put the body? We started to get photographs that we have honestly learned more from photographing these creatures than I could ever imagine possible. The photos, once we look at them and zoom through them, they tell a story of their own. And whether people believe it or not, like I said, we've got the pictures to back it up. I'm nervous saying some of this stuff. I don't want somebody showing up knocking on my door. If you know what I mean, it's not somebody wanting to know about the pictures. I I don't want the men in black showing up and and saying, hey, uh, we've, we've heard about you guys, but... We've got pictures of portals, doorways, things coming out of them, just crazy stuff and things that don't make sense. And I wish I could say, hey, this is just a natural creature, but we've seen too many of them and we've seen them do too many weird stuff, weird things to see it from that angle ourselves. But we continued on our journey, started getting a lot of dog man, dog men. We had the uh, same place we got the Bigfoot about a mile away, that Bigfoot where I just felt in my gut it was time to go. We go out hiking that same spring, and we hear we're probably 200 yards from the end of a small gravel road beside a what's they call those ponds with the is Oxbow Lake is one of those where the river cuts off and makes this U shaped big pond, and we're right beside one of those in this same area, and we're just talking and having fun like always, but we're back away from everybody. The water has just receded, and we hear a massive snort. I mean, it literally sounded like a, a, a rhinoceros or something, just snorting as loud as it could. Brenda, at that point, jumped so high. And the jumping, <laughs> was, I almost wet myself. She, it scared the living daylights out of me. And, of course, then we turn and start taking pictures, and lo and behold, what did we find right. when we got back to the car? <laughs> We were right up, we were within probably 100 feet of these, and it was a 
female dog man. She was standing bipedally looking out from behind a tree and a baby dog man out front. I say baby, a juvenile out front. And that's what we saw in the pictures after we got back from that big snort. Had a second one. We're fixing to post it a second time on TikTok, but it's a very much a bipedal canine. It doesn't have the claws. It has a lo- elongated paw looking. Uh, and I think it's a female because there's a juvenile over to the side, but it doesn't show. But that one, uh, we heard a, a grunt and maybe some sticks breaking or something. Sometimes we hear sticks breaking. Sometimes we have things thrown at us. Nothing serious. Rocks, acorns. Anytime anything weird happens, uh, anytime we smell anything, hear anything, or there are just certain areas that we've learned to look for, and we take photos of those areas. We do not wait. I think where most people mess up when they're trying to photograph or video uh, Bigfoot or Dogman is they wait till they see something, and then you're usually too late. Uh, there are some good videos out there, but our best pictures especially come from it's just either something sounds like something's there, we smell something there. And, and by the way, no matter what anybody has said, we get some of our best photos when all of nature's sounds are going. It doesn't always go dead quiet. It does sometimes. I think that's more when they're in a predatory mood, mood, maybe out hunting, but sometimes everything's going on. We'll still take pictures and still get some of our very best pictures when everything's happening around them. And sometimes it does go dead quiet. If it goes dead quiet, we always take pictures. But sometimes we had a juvenile Bigfoot in Huntsville, Alabama, and we had friends out with us just to say, they, we said, hey, we want to show, hey, we can get these pictures with people with us. We can show you how to get the pictures. And we come back, it was throwing acorns at us. We never saw it, but we got a great picture of it. It's in the book as well, but we got a great picture of it. And after we zoomed in when we got home, and so just a little juvenile Sasquatch had been in there throwing photos at us. So that's some of the stuff we, we run into. I think Brenda's got something to jump in with. A lot of the times while we're out, I'm busy taking pictures of butterflies and flowers. <laughs> Okay. And, uh, waterfalls and, nice. and oh there's a bigfoot got to take a picture of that not that i see it but it's just you sense it or it might accidentally get in my flower picture it's just it's so strange that we see so many of them and i feel that they know that we're not there to harm them mm. we're just having fun we're yeah. just having fun we're and so they show themselves I, i'm not sure why but i'm just know that I don't want to hurt them. I hope nobody else wants to hurt them as well. Yeah, we don't believe that one should be captured or taken down for, yeah. for science or, or, or whatever. One last thing I will throw out of the seven visuals we had uh, last year, which I know sounds extraordinary. And I don't blame folks if they said, I get people that say, I've seen Bigfoot, but you're lying. We're, we're not. We, we've got the pictures to, to prove it. Now, we didn't get good pictures off of all the seven we saw. We got pictures of a lot we didn't see, but uh, it, we did get some good pictures of some of the ones we saw. But uh, every single one of those, every single one, it was maybe where we were going one direction and we felt like maybe we need to turn around and go another. We were, maybe we just felt very strongly, we needed to be in a certain area. We're at the crossroads in a trail, and we're taking one way. And we're saying, nope, we got to take that other way in the trail. And we wind up just looking straight at one. It's just amazing. It's almost innate. It's just almost something that uh, if you really just listen listen to your inner compass there, you learn how to. It's not just natural. There's some natural things we look for. We always look around water. Uh, we love long trails. That uh, we, we take the small trail off the big trail every time, and then we look for where there's a long shot, and then there's a twist in the trail. We look for downed trees. They love to hang out around downed trees. We get some of our best pictures there, but really it's just going with your gut has a lot to do with it too. And, but more importantly than anything, we enjoy every step. This is the funnest journey of our life. Yeah. And Robin said earlier though that we do everything wrong. We don't do the wood knocks. We don't do the the whoops. We don't do infrareds. We don't go out at night. I mean, <laughs> we get all of our pictures during the day because there's no way in heck we're gonna go out in the woods at night knowing what's in there during the daytime. <laughs> That's right. We wouldn't make for a good reality TV show. We're pretty boring to see all these Bigfoot, man. Well, here here's a hot take. It might that might be why you're getting all this stuff is because you're not doing all that stuff. I mean, I'm sure I'll get some comments back about that, but you're not doing the normal stuff. So I don't know. I do have a few questions for you. I'm sure that listeners are, are gonna be like, hey, can you share the general area where there were like Bigfoot and Dogman hanging out, because that's not really a super normal thing. 
Sure, sure, yeah. But what we don't do is we don't tell absolute specifics, right. and there's a reason for that, but it's more about my concern of copyright and pictures that we would use here and there. And yeah, I don't want anybody, especially landowners want anonymity, but I'll be glad to. And I will tell you uh, straight up another thing that really we do different from everybody is we actually thrive. We love to look for areas where nobody's ever, we've never heard. There's the BFRO is never reported. Nobody's ever seen or heard of one that we know of just so it meets our criteria. And our criteria is simple because we found them all the way from the Mississippi River on the very west end of Tennessee. We love rivers. We love larger rivers, smaller rivers, anywhere there's water. Water is the number one thing we look for. Obviously, it's best when that's when that's around a large amount of woods, but we love to see how urban we can get. And if you do get on our website, uh, I don't know if we have him named, but I know there's a TikTok that we talk about him a lot, but the Jackson Bigfoot, which is probably the second best facial that we've ever gotten of a Bigfoot. He's, you can see the skin shine. You can see the eye width. You can see the width of his mouth. You can just see things that just aren't, you know, you just can't make that happen on the Jackson Bigfoot. We love to, to see how urban we can get with Bigfoot too, because we don't always go deep into the woods. We we truly do everything wrong. But up here in West Tennessee, I'll give you some rivers. We photographed them around that people would know, and we photographed them as far east as, as far as we've went is a uh, Cookville Crossville area around the Caney Fork River, the Rock Island area. We photographed there. There's one in the book from there. We photographed all around the Obion or Obion River here. In, I've only lived in West Tennessee for about a year and a half. And Brenda's just two years. Brenda's been here for about a year. And so, uh, so I'm not for different people pronounce that river different. The Hatchie River's got a bunch, but uh, the Forked Deer River here, of course, that one was on the East Fork of the Stones River. We did go back. I haven't told a lot of people. We went back Murfreesboro City limits and got a decent picture. It's not what we would call it a, a grade A, but we got a decent picture there on the West Fork of the Stones in Murfreesboro, but just really anywhere there's water and a good amount of land. I like going to places that have been also one thing we really like to hit is if say an area has has been there's been a lot of trees there but they've went in and messed it up and cut the timber down and piled the trees up uh, just so it's been pretty fresh and there's woods around it. We'll get a lot of pictures of cryptids right there where trees have been downed. I think they're out there because they're mad, but we get a lot of them there, but primarily around any major river. If I were to tell someone to start looking, I'd look for rivers, downed trees, rock outcroppings. We find some there. Those are just some of the natural things we look for. But then if you have maybe national uh, uh, parks or wildlife refuges that have trails cut out in them, but trails that very few people walk. And we'll even get them all the way back to what we call, we love the areas that are what we call the overlap areas. And that's where that's where it's pretty much as far as people go. Maybe the end of a little bitty old country gravel road where there's a gate and a long trail or something. I always take a picture down those long trails and look in those areas because I think I, there's a place in the book Jeremiah, where I say we are the bait, but we're their entertainment. They're very curious about humans. They don't show themselves very much, but 90%, 95% of the ones we photograph are looking straight at us. But yet, to answer your question, any of those rivers, we photographed at the Tennessee River as well, got some really good ones there. Photographed down in Tishomingo County, Mississippi, got a really good female Bigfoot down there with that's obviously female. And we get Bigfoot and Dogman and everything else almost everywhere we go, as long as it meets the the criteria and, and we look for that water and we look for if we're in a state park that's pretty busy we like to go in the winter when nobody's there but that's just some of the things we look for in some of the places we've been Rovin, have you ever considered going to maybe some of the hot spots like bankhead in alabama or like lbl or you hit the maybe not as well known areas but have yeah. you ever thought of so doing that. so yeah we have we went we've been to the lbl before and our experience at the lbl we got we had one fantastic day at the lbl of photographing i'll just say for clarity because i'm concerned about their copyright stuff nothing obviously that was used in the book but just a fantastic day of taking pictures since then though the lbl for us is really hit has been hit and miss it's about two hours from the house. We try to stay a little bit closer than that, but we did get another picture that we've used on 
one of our videos. It's just like a Bigfoot crawling straight down. And the weird thing is on this one, he was crawling straight in front of us, like in an army crawl or a spider crawl. Mm. We photographed him. We got down there, and that's one of the times we walked right past him, past where he was. We photographed him on the way down. Didn't know he was there because it was maybe he's so far off and blended in. We get back, see him in the photos, but we realize, hey, these are the photos we went when we walked down there. And when when we got right down to the bottom, I looked at Brent and I said, "We've got to go. This is just one of the, we've just got to go." And uh, so we turned around and left there real quick. I don't know what it was about that, but yeah. Other than that, we haven't been to. We did pick up a juvenile Bigfoot in a place where it was known for Bigfoot sightings, but for the most part, we thrive on places that most people have never seen one. We don't consider it a detriment. We consider it and not just a challenge. We almost consider it an advantage if there haven't been a lot of sightings there. Mm. I know that sounds crazy and against the traditional norm. We would like to go to, what is it? Salt Fork. I, I think it's Salt. Yeah. Yeah. We'd like to go up there. We've got some of these places on our radar, but we have people, you know, on TikTok and on YouTube and reaching out to us. say, you got to check out our hotspot and we don't even have hotspots, man. <laughs> <laughs> we find them Pretty regularly, so it's not really important to us as to whether most people have a lot have been seen there or a lot. But we'd be willing to do that for sure, just for kicks. It'd be fun. Absolutely. Do you think there's any spiritual aspect or connection to these creatures at all? Absolutely. And I can tell you one right now that, um, no, I believe they're multidimensional. Personally, I have a biblical worldview, which I, but I think you have to dig deep. And I do believe it's tied into the Nephilim and the attempt to contaminate the DNA of the planet uh, before Noah's flood. And it's, the Bible says before, them, the days, before those days and after the days of Noah's flood as well. But I will tell you something that I wasn't going to mention, but since you asked that directly, absolutely, you can go to our website right now, www.thebigfootfinders.com. You can go to the speaking engagement page. You can scroll down to the bottom picture on the speaking engagement page if you go to it. And you'll see a picture of me standing behind a podium. It was the press conference we did to, to, to release the book and let the world know, hey, these things are real. We're having trouble getting people's attention. And we get photographs of these things all the time and good ones. Not all of them are that good. But if you go to the bottom of that speaking engagement page and you look at the podium and you look at my pants, that photo was not like that when we took it. We made every effort to make sure everything was perfect. But you look at the podium. On the speaking engagement page, the very bottom, you scroll in, you're going to see a face that's appearing on the bottom of that podium. And if you'll take a screenshot of that on your phone and then you'll zoom in, you'll see very much a, a evil and devious looking face. And all I can tell you is we would never put that there. Our web guy still doesn't even know it's there. And these things, we've seen the weirdest things. We've seen photo manipulation. I know we're going to start to sound crazy. I won't go too deep into that because it's a whole nother realm. But yes, there is absolutely a spiritual aspect to these beings, not just Sasquatch, but all cryptids. That's why there's, in my opinion, there's no body or it's hard to find one. Uh, that's why they can see it, be seen many times in very urban settings. I believe they're 100% natural when they're here. I believe they eat, they smell, they leave tracks, they hunt, they have a scent, they make noise. But I believe there is definitely a spiritual multidimensional element to these creatures. And we've got a lot of photos that would back that up. So. That's awesome. I guess same question for, do you think that also applies to, to Dogman as well? That there's some kind of spiritual connection. We talked about the Nephilim and that's, yeah. there's some really wild stuff yeah. you can get into. You can, it's a deep rabbit hole, but I will tell you, absolutely yes. We have seen, I was in Manila and usually Brenda's with me and I try not to do anything without her because it's our thing we do together, but I travel a lot with my job. And so I'll get to stop at different places. And I was in Manila, Arkansas and stopped at a certain, just a certain body of woods there. And actually just walked right. And I just felt like I was supposed to stop there once again. It was one of the seven I saw last year in a look up, walking down a little trail beside a, a lake. And there's a Sasquatch and it walks up real fast and just stops. And it, I've got pictures. There's a TikTok of it too, but I wish, sometimes I just wish, I'm like, man, I just wish I could sit down and show you this stuff on my phone, zoom in. It'll just blow your mind. But 
it's a Sasquatch. It's a solid creature. Now, by the time I took the first picture, it was still very solid. It is very solid. You couldn't see through it. It was solid. And then the thing morphs into its background and turns into vines, but you can still see the outline of the Sasquatch. And then there's nothing but vines. And then there's a dog man coming out of that same bunch of vines. And so there is a, that would not, that could not happen were this just a natural creature. And so it makes me nervous to, you know, be, but we're very transparent and we feel like we're honestly, as we're Christians, we feel like we're called by God to bring this stuff to life. But there's definitely a spiritual element. And yes, if this were just a natural creature, you wouldn't find Bigfoot and Dogman. We find little people, all these at the very same, get great photos of all this stuff at the same place we photograph Bigfoot. So that alone tells me we've got a picture of a Bigfoot with a fox looking thing on its shoulder. We get pictures of these things with all kinds of other, just things that it's just not natural and creatures that maybe you know, they, they look like a real creature, but there's just something off by them. We get that all the time when Bigfoot's around. It's just crazy. I don't know if that answers your question. I can't even remember. Well, I ramble so much, man, but this stuff is just so exciting to me, but it, it overloads your brain sometimes, too. There's a spiritual element. I, I, I definitely agree, and I feel like the crazier things get out there, it, it seems like there's a there's been a real increased focus on paranormal cryptids in the last few years. And I think it's important. I mean, uh, I'm a Christian as well. It's important that uh, Christians, they're able to know what's going on with those fields and not be, I think there was a, a time frame a long time ago, or maybe 15, 20 years ago, where people would be like freaked out or be like, oh, we don't talk about Bigfoot or Dog Man. Yeah. But it's in important and there's a lot of podcasts that are into that as well there's like blurry creatures there's a confessionals those guys it's important that there's people in christianity that are also talking in the field of bigfoot and cryptids and dog man and i, sure. I just think it's well, important i wish this were just a natural creature i wish it were a gigantopithecus i wish dog man didn't exist and there was just bigfoot and people could wrap their brain around that a whole lot easier it would be easier for the public to receive mm -hmm. and but so so you know it, it wasn't we've had a total on the cover of our book, it says, warning, this book will rock your worldview. And our book doesn't even go deep into this stuff at all. It just It's just how we photograph Bigfoot. That's all it's about. So if anybody's being afraid of all this stuff, you, we don't go into that in our book. But I will tell you, learning the truth will rock your worldview. And that's what most people are so frightened of. Uh, I tell people all the time, science changes in every generation. And I think this stuff will one day be scientifically proven. It's just beyond what we can comprehend or know now. But the idiots of one generation somehow become the heroes of the next mm. uh you know and so so i think that this stuff will be proven as technology increases and, and we continue to you know do what we do and many others you know continue to do the great work they're doing so Absolutely. hopefully the truth will come out and that's one thing that when we were younger we were taught that this stuff is not real there was no other planet or other life on other planets and there was no such thing as ghost or Bigfoot or Dogman. So we, we grew up believing that this wasn't real. And so when you do see it, you, your mind has no place to put it. You're trying to figure out what that was because you weren't taught that. You didn't grow up with it. And now the generations are growing up with Bigfoot's real, aliens are real, UFOs are real. And maybe it's a little bit easier for this generation to wrap their brain around it. Oh, I agree, Brenda. Definitely. It's it's way easier for current generation to, to wrap their mind around it. No question. I, I tell people all the time, when I saw my first Bigfoot, I wasn't trying to see a Bigfoot. I was trying to unsee a Bigfoot. Mm. I wasn't thinking that's a Bigfoot. I was thinking it can't be and trying to rationalize and justify every way. And, and, and it's like your brain is a library and you're looking for a place to file it, but there's nowhere to file it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I believe the truth is always the best 
policy. So. Absolutely. And something I didn't mention before, I just want to say rest in peace, Scott Carpenter. I never got to talk to him, but it's very interesting. And Rovin and Brenda, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. It has been a really fun and enlightening chat. Do you mind taking a few minutes just to remind people how they can keep up to date with what you're doing, how they can pick up the book, the Bigfoot Finders and all that good stuff? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. And really what we're looking for, it's not book sales, it's just connections. It, it's great to know people like yourself and, and your listeners out there because sometimes you can feel all alone doing this. But yes, our, the best place to get our book, and it's available on just about every format out there, but the best place to get it is to go and to connect with us in any way is to go to our website, www.com thebigfootfinders.com. It has links to purchase the book. It has all about speaking engagements. It tells about it. it tell, we have our newsletter and you can sign up for that. It has links of places that we've uh, been available and spoken and, and things like that. But more than anything, it's just great to, to be able to connect. But yes, the book is called The Bigfoot Finders. You can get it straight on Amazon, uh, KDP, uh, Lulu. Um, and we just found out today that it's available on Walmart <laughs> but it, it costs twice as much there, so don't buy it on Walmart. You can also uh, have, there's also links on our website to our YouTube channel, our TikTok channel, and Facebook. We, we do most on TikTok as, as well. We're not that good at this social media thing. But yeah, www.thebigfootfinders.com is the best way to reach us. So That's awesome. Yeah, definitely, guys. Check it out. Check out their stuff. It is very informative and very interesting. And I just thank you so much for coming on guys. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank truly, you. truly our honor, Jeremiah. Thanks for all you do, man. Just want to take a few minutes to say thank you to you, all my listeners for listening to the podcast. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube, making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast, Thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed. Share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's a list. All right, I'm going to use this space uh, this week to announce that I'll be at the Sasquatch Summerfest in Oak Ridge, Oregon as an attender. I won't be presenting or anything, but I'll be hanging out trying to interview people that have had Bigfoot encounters. If you're from the Oak Ridge, Oregon area or surrounding and you've had a Bigfoot experience, please contact me directly, BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Also, Priscilla was nice enough that if you get your tickets through SasquatchSummerfest.com and use code BigfootSociety, you can get 50% off the cost of your tickets, which is a big amount. So... Uh, code Bigfoot Society to get 50% off your tickets, SasquatchSummerFest.com, and uh, helps out the podcast as well. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it.